on the anatomically correct world of anatomy. On the anatomically correct world of anatomy program A, we've got a truckload of fun and excitement lined up for you. Following a quick review of the urinary system, we'll take you on a learning adventure through the endocrine system, where you will jump on the gland wagon and get the scoop on hormones. Then we'll examine the reproductive system. You'll even learn about male and female reproductive organs and the structures that support them. It's time for the pop quiz! Where in the human body are the adrenal glands located? A. On top of each kidney. B. Inside your stomach. C. Behind your brain. D. Under your fingernails. Stay tuned for the answer! system is our friend. No matter how many times it wakes you up in the middle of the night, remember, the urinary system is working for you. Its main job is to constantly remove waste from our bodies by forming urine. It also maintains normal blood composition. So just like a water purification plant filters bad stuff out of water, the urinary system filters waste from the fluids in our bodies and returns good stuff to our blood. The whole urinary system is made up of a pair of kidneys, a pair of ureters, a single urinary bladder, and a single urethra. We'll tackle the kidneys first. The kidneys are two bean-shaped organs. They're located in the superior lumbar region. There are three regions in the kidney. The outer renal cortex, the middle renal medulla, and the inner renal pelvis. The kidneys are responsible for removing nitrogenous waste. That's waste that contains nitrogen. The kidneys remove these wastes by forming urine. This maintains a healthy acid-base fluid balance in the blood. The main structures that make up the kidneys are tiny blood processing units called nephrons. They are the functional units of the kidneys, the workhorses you might say. These little nephrons carry out the processes that form urine. And who could ask for a more fulfilling job? There are over one million nephrons in each kidney. Each nephron is made up of a renal corpuscle and a renal tubule. The renal corpuscle is responsible for glomerular filtration. Glomerular filtration is the first process in urine formation. The renal corpuscle is made up of two structures, the glomerulus and another structure called the glomerular or Bowman's capsule. Just remember that the renal corpuscle is in charge of the glomerular filtration. You don't have to know that much detail because, hey, this is anatomy, not physiology. In any event, you do know about the glomerulus now. But still, that's only one of the structures that makes up a nephron. Another structure is the renal tubule. The renal tubule's job is to selectively reabsorb water and substances like sodium, potassium, calcium, and other important stuff that's needed by the body. It also secretes waste no longer needed by the body. The renal tubule is divided up into three regions. These regions are the twisty turny proximal convoluted tubule the U-shaped loop of Henle, and the twisty, turny, distal convoluted tubule. When the urine formed in the renal tubules exits the DCT, it's delivered to a collecting duct. The collecting duct collects urine. Wow, what a great hobby. The collecting duct collects urine from the DCTs of a whole lot of nephrons. You see, the millions of nephrons in your kidneys all have DCTs that empty out into collecting ducts. These collecting ducts deliver the urine to the renal pelvis. Then it flows into a ureter. Remember, each kidney has a ureter, so you have two ureters. Not really much one can say about the ureters. They're really thin. They conduct urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. Pretty simple, huh? Now, the kidneys are an important part of the urinary system, but the precious urine they create would have no place to go were it not for the worm-like ureters the cavernous urinary bladder, 
and the muscular urethra. Section B, the urinary bladder and the urethra. The urinary bladder and the urethra are the last few rest stops for urine on that highway of relief. The bladder is a collapsible muscular sac that lies just behind and below the pubic symphysis. The pubic symphysis is the cartilage that connects the two sides of the pelvis. The bladder's prime job is to temporarily store the urine that's constantly being produced by the kidneys. The next adventure on the urine itinerary is the urethra. The urethra is a muscular tube that transports urine from the bladder to the outside world so that everyone can enjoy it. <laughs> All the urethra contains two muscular structures called sphincters. It has an internal urethral sphincter made up of smooth muscle. The internal urethral sphincter is under involuntary control, meaning you can't control it consciously. The other sphincter in the urethra is the external urethral sphincter. It's made up of skeletal muscle and under voluntary control. We'll go into more details on the sphincters in a sec. Just let us elaborate on the urethra for a bit longer. At 8 inches, the male urethra is a lot longer than the 1.5 inch female urethra. The male urethra also conducts urine in semen, while the female urethra conducts only urine. Well, that's the bladder and the urethra. You should be thankful for these organs. They make micturition, the act of emptying the bladder, possible. You see, when the bladder fills up with urine, its smooth muscle contracts, causing the internal sphincter to open wide. So if you're not ready to go because you're in church, running a road race, or dancing with your prom date, your body helps buy you some time. We can use our external sphincter to temporarily delay the release of urine. You know, hold it in. This is because the external sphincter is under voluntary control. The endocrine system. The endocrine system is an unsung hero that regulates reproduction, growth, immunity, and all other processes occurring in the body. Basically, it maintains a stable environment for the body called homeostasis. This environment helps all the other organs of all the other systems to function properly. But all you have to know is that without the endocrine system, there'd be no life. Still, the endocrine system never gets the credit it's due. But today, it will. <laughs> Section A, Organs of the Endocrine System. The super exciting organs of the endocrine system are small and dispersed throughout the body, and they're all responsible for producing chemicals called hormones. Hormones are sort of like chemical messengers. They are secreted into and carried by the bloodstream. Then the hormones travel to individual target cells that they act on. In other words, they bind to specific receptors on target cells to alter the cell's activity. The major endocrine organs are the pituitary gland, the thyroid gland, the parathyroid gland, the adrenal gland, the pancreas, the gonads, the pineal gland, and the thymus. People sometimes call the pituitary gland the master gland because hormones released by it direct the activity of almost all other endocrine organs. The pituitary gland is located below the hypothalamus. It's connected to the hypothalamus by the infundibulum, which is a funnel-shaped stalk structure. The pituitary gland can be divided into two regions, the posterior and anterior lobes. The posterior lobe is made up of nerve fibers and acts as a storage area for two hormones produced by the hypothalamus. One of these hormones is oxytocin, which initiates uterine contractions during parturition, or labor, as most people know it. Another hormone is the antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. The main function of ADH is to stimulate the reabsorption of water from the collecting tubules. ADH is also known as vasopressin. The anterior lobe of the pituitary gland is made up of a glandular tissue that manufactures a whole group of hormones called trophic hormones. They are, now brace yourself because this is a mouthful. The cells that produce the tropic hormones are the somatotrophs, the thyrotrophs, the corticotrophs, the lactotrophs, and the gonadotrophs. The somatotrophs include the growth hormone, or GH. The thyrotrophs include the thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH. The corticotrophs include the adrenocorticotrophic hormone, or ACTH. The gonadotrophs include the follicle stimulating hormone, or FSH, and the luteinizing hormone, or LH. And finally, the lactotrophs include prolactin. Now, 
You want to hear the details? Do we have a choice? Well, to cut you a break, we'll only give you the details on one of those hormones, GH, the growth hormone. The rest you can learn about in physiology. GH stimulates normal growth in bone and muscles. If the anterior lobe secretes too much or too little of this hormone, it can cause some pretty serious problems. For example, if too little GH is present during childhood, dwarfism can occur. If there's too much GH in children, gigantism occurs. Too much GH in adults, as in the case of our 16th president, Abe Lincoln, causes acromegaly. This causes abnormally large hands, feet, and facial features, which worked for Lincoln, but doesn't work for everybody. We'll talk about the thyroid gland next. The thyroid gland is a butterfly-shaped organ located in the neck, anterior to, or in front of, the trachea. Basically, the thyroid hormones increase metabolic rate or oxygen consumption in most cells of the body, and calcitonin regulates calcium. The next major endocrine organ is the parathyroid gland. The parathyroid glands are tiny glands embedded in the back of the thyroid gland. They secrete parathyroid hormone, or PTH, which is important in calcium and phosphate regulation. The adrenal gland! The adrenal glands are triangular-shaped glands located on the top of each kidney. Each adrenal gland is actually made up of two endocrine glands, the outer adrenal cortex and the inner adrenal medulla. The outer adrenal cortex secretes three groups of hormones known as glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, and androgens. You don't have to know about these hormones in detail until you study physiology. The inner adrenal medulla is made up of nervous tissue. It secretes the catecholamines, which are made up of hormones epinephrine and norepinephrine. Ladies and gentlemen, the pancreas. The pancreas, which we discussed with the digestive system, is a yellowish tadpole-shaped gland located near the duodenum of the small intestine. Aside from aiding in digestion, the pancreas produces the hormones insulin, glucagon, and somatostatin. These hormones are responsible for the regulation of glucose in the body. The gonads! Both males and females have gonads. In females, the gonads are called the ovaries. In males, the gonads are called the testes. The gonads produce sex hormones that regulate reproductive functions. In females, these sex hormones are estrogen and progesterone. In males, the hormones produced by the testes are called androgens. The most popular and important male androgen is testosterone. The thymus gland is located posterior to or behind the sternum. The thymus gland regresses with age, which basically means it's larger and more noticeable in infants than in adults. The thymus gland produces the two major hormones, thymosin and thymopoietin. These hormones help T lymphocytes mature and become immunocompetent, or ready to do their job within the immune system. In case you don't remember, T lymphocytes are involved in your immune system. Other important endocrine structures. There are also a bunch of organs that belong to other systems, but also pull some weight in the endocrine system. These organs are the heart, the kidneys, and the gastrointestinal tract. The heart produces the hormone atrial natriuretic peptide, which decreases blood pressure. The kidneys produce erythropoietin, a hormone that increases red blood cell production. The gastrointestinal tract produces a whole bunch of digestive hormones, like gastrin and cholecystokinin. These hormones regulate digestion. And finally, the skin produces a chemical called cholecalciferol. Cholecalciferol is a precursor to vitamin D3. Active vitamin D3 helps the body absorb calcium. The reproductive system. Now the main function of the reproductive system is to produce offspring and perpetuate genes. You know what that means. Making babies and handing down traits. But in order to do this, both males and females need certain organs. So before we go into the specifics of male and female anatomy, we'll give you a brief overview of the most important organs. And now... The gonads, purveyors uh, of life. The gonads are the primary reproductive organs for both males and females. Male gonads are called testes. Female gonads are called ovaries. The gonads, or as they're referred to in junior high, the nads, are responsible for producing gametes and the sex hormones. Gametes are, bluntly put, sex cells. The sex cells in males are sperm, and the sex cells in females are ova, or eggs. 
These two sex cells fuse together to form zygotes. These zygotes will then go on to mature into individual organisms who eat, drool, and enjoy annoying foam dinosaurs. Sex hormones control the activity and maturation of the reproductive system, as well as a few other organs or tissues. We'll go into a more detailed description of them a little later. There are also other reproductive organs we'll talk about in this section. Things like accessory glands and external genitalia. These organs have accessory functions that we'll go into in just a little bit. Section A. Male anatomy. Male anatomy is divided up into the gonads, the male accessory duct system, and the accessory glands of reproduction. We'll start with the gonads. The testes are the male gonads. They are the primary male sex organs. So, for those of you who thought the penis was a primary sex organ, eh, sorry, you are wrong. The testes produce sperm, which we've already mentioned, and androgens, which are the male sex hormones. The most dominant male sex hormone is testosterone. Testosterone! Testosterone is the male hormone that's in charge of reproductive maturation, puberty, the male sex drive, or libido, and last but... <laughs> definitely not least, normal sperm production. Testosterone is even in charge of such Peter Brady-esque secondary reproductive characteristics as the deepening of the voice. And now, the male duct system caps the wave. The male duct system puts the duct in reproductive. They're what make easy, inexpensive sperm travel possible. The male duct system transports sperm from the testes to the outside world. All told, the duct system is made up of four parts, the epididymis, the vas deferens, the ejaculatory duct, and the urethra. The epididymis is a coiled tube about 1.5 inches long and is found on the posterior surface of each testis. The epididymides receive immature sperm from the testes. The sperm mature and learn to swim as they wiggle through the epididymis for about 20 days. After leaving the epididymis, the sperm enter the vas deferens a tube that is about 18 inches long. The vas deferens, along with muscle, blood vessels, and nerves, makes up the spermatic cord. The vas deferens ends in an expanded section known as the ampulla. The ampulla forms part of the ejaculatory duct, the next duct in the duct system. The ejaculatory duct is formed by the union of the ampullae and a duct from the seminal vesicle, which is a male accessory organ of the reproductive system. We'll give you the details on the seminal vesicle a little later on. Now, the ejaculatory duct passes through a structure called the prostate gland and eventually empties into the urethra. Funnily enough, the urethra is a switch hitter. It carries both urine and semen and is a part of both the male urinary and reproductive systems. But sperm do always have the right of way over urine. Out of my way, buddy! I've got to be somewhere. All right, all right already. I'm moving. Jeez. The urethra is the very end of the male duct system. It carries sperm to the tip of the penis and into the outside world. The male reproductive accessory glands have a messy but important job. The male accessory glands produce a fluid that helps transport the sperm. They also make nutrients and chemicals that nourish, protect, and help sperm move. All these fluids and nutrients, together with sperm, make semen. Arr. No, different kind of semen. This semen can also be called seminal fluid. It's a liquid that's 1% sperm and 99% accessory gland secretions. What are those? Glad you asked. The accessory glands are the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the bulbourethral gland. The seminal vesicles are located posterior to, or just behind, the bladder. They produce a yellowish thick fluid that's emptied into the ejaculatory duct. This magical elixir contains all the nourishment for the sperm and chemicals that help it sneak into the ovum, which is something we'll talk about later. The prostate gland is found just at the base of the bladder. It produces a milky fluid that's emptied into the urethra. This particular fluid plays a role in sperm mobility. The bulbourethral glands also known as the Cowper's glands, are just below the prostate. They produce a thick, clear mucus that drains into the urethra. This mucus is released right before ejaculation to neutralize traces of acidic urine in the urethra and to provide lubrication. So the bulbourethral gland, the prostate gland, and the seminal vesicle all pitch in to produce semen. But 
neither the vulvo-urethral glands or any of this other stuff would have a purpose at all were it not for. The external male genitalia consists of two structures, the penis and the scrotum. The penis is the male copulatory organ. The penis is designed to deliver sperm into the female reproductive tract. It's made up of an attached root and a free shaft. The majority of the penis is made up of erectile tissue, which is a spongy connective tissue. This erectile tissue fills up with blood during an erection to allow the penis to effortlessly penetrate the vagina. The scrotum is the final important part of the male external genitalia. The scrotum is a pouch of darkly pigmented skin suspended near the root of the penis, which houses the testes or testicles in two compartments. That's its job. The scrotum tries to provide an optimal environment for sperm production. It tries to maintain a temperature that's three degrees lower than body temperature. Female the ovaries are the female gonads. They are the primary female sex organs. Their main job is to produce ova. These female sex cells are also known as eggs. Eggs produce the female sex hormones estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen is the female sex hormone responsible for female puberty and the maturation of the reproductive system. And progesterone acts with estrogen to develop the breasts and jumpstart menstruation. It also maintains the right environment in the uterus for implantation and growth of a zygote. Just like males, females also have a duct system. It's made up of three structures the uterine tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. The uterine or fallopian tubes cordially receive and conduct the ovum from the ovaries and toward the uterus. They also provide fantastic sites where fertilization takes place. The uterus is a hollow organ with thick walls. It is the site of implantation of a zygote. Remember, a zygote is formed in the fallopian tubes and housed in the uterus. That means its job is to receive, retain, and nourish a completely fertilized egg. The uterus leads into the vagina through an opening called the cervix. These layers are the parametrium, which is the outer layer, the myometrium, which is the thick muscular middle layer, and the endometrium, which is the inner layer. The endometrium is the side where embryos are implanted. Yep, that's where the zygote latches on. The superior or upper sublayer of the endometrium is called the functional layer. This is the layer that crumbles away during menstruation. Don't worry. The wall of the endometrium is eventually regenerated and replaced by an underlying sublayer called the basal layer. So it can fall off all over again and again and again. The third duct is the vagina. The vagina is a thin-walled tube that is the female copulatory organ. The vagina is also a passageway for baby delivery and menstrual flow. The female external genitalia, or vulva, is made up of the mons pubis, the labia majora, the labia minora, the vestibule, and the clitoris. The mons pubis is a fatty round area overlying the pubic bone. After puberty, it is covered with pubic hair. The labia majora are pigmented, hair-covered, outer fatty skin folds. They are located posterior to or behind the mons pubis. The mons pubis is a female answer to the scrotum. The labia minora is a thin, delicate, inner fold covered with a thin layer of mucous membrane and oil. They're completely enclosed by the labia majora. The vestibule is an inner region completely enclosed by the labia minora. This area contains the greater and lesser vestibular glands. These glands are kind of like the bulbo-urethral glands in the male reproductive system. They release mucus into the vestibule in order to lubricate it during sexual intercourse. The clitoris is the last part of the female external genitalia that we'll talk about. The clitoris is a female erectile organ that's kind of like the penis. It's the main structure that contributes to female arousal. The clitoris is a protruding structure made up of erectile tissue. It has two roots and, like the penis, it also has a shaft. The clitoris is full of sensory nerve endings, so, like the penis, the clitoris is sensitive to the touch. The breasts are also sometimes discussed with the female external genitalia. Female breasts contain a number of structures that are really important if you want to nourish a newborn baby. These structures are the mammary glands and the nipples. The mammary glands are modified sweat glands contained inside the breasts. They produce the milk that nourishes a newborn baby. The milk is produced by small glands and then carried to the nipples by a system of ducts. The nipple is the structure that ejects milk. The areola is the center section of the breast that surrounds the nipple. 
it contains sebaceous glands which produce oil that prevents the nipple from drying up and cracking. The areola is pigmented and darkens during pregnancy. This dark area is like a marker that helps the infants locate the milk. Etched in stone. All right, here we go again. Testosterone is a hormone that helps males make tests. Oh no, that's not right. New stuff. Testosterone is the male hormone in charge of reproductive maturation. Ah, that's much better. Catch in a stone. You see, I'm searching the answer to the quiz. The question was, where in the human body are the adrenal glands located? The correct answer is A, on top of each kidney. The small triangle-shaped glands produce the hormones epinephrine and norepinephrine. <laughs> This is PBS. To order this or any other standard Deviant School products, call 1 800 238 9669 or visit www.standarddeviance.org.